Well, I invite you to return with me to the fourth chapter of First Peter, if you have a Bible. First Peter chapter 4, as we continue our study in the letter of First Peter, uh, living hope in a hostile world, and to be reminded what it means to live in this hostile world, even in the face of suffering. That's been one of the main themes in Peter's letter and in this section that we're looking at. That's what he continues to cover. And last week we considered the fact that how we are to be motivated to live for the Lord in times that are uh, hostile in these perilous times, but also in times of suffering. And in all of this, we're reminded, firstly, we were reminded last week to have the same attitude as Jesus Christ, that we are to have the mind of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, when he came to this earth, his, his attitude, his thought was to do the will of God. He said, I came not to do my own will, but to do the will of the Father. And you and I, we were told to arm ourselves. It was the idea of being prepared for battle, that we would have the same way of thinking as Jesus Christ, to consider our old lives past and and over and to live according to our new nature in Jesus Christ. That's what we looked at last week. And I'm not going to go through this this outline uh, that we looked at last week, but we're up to the second part of this. And so if you missed that last, watch watch last week's message. But um, today we're going to look at the next motivation the next encouragement that Peter gives us to live for the Lord, which is related to the urgency of time. And as we've been singing this morning and being reminded that time is running out, the end is near. And Peter actually says, as he's already said, that we're no longer to live to the lusts of the flesh, to live to our own desires, but we're to live to the will of God. And so I want us just to read, uh, jump straight into verses 7 through 11. And in this, we're going to see that Peter reminds us of a reality. It's a sobering reality, but it's also for us not something we should be scared about. It's something that we're told that we should be comforted by and how we should respond. And so today we're going to look at living in the light of the end, living in the light of the Lord's return. Let's read 1 Peter chapter 4 and we'll read verses 7 through 11 and we'll pray and then Uh, look at what this passage tells us this morning about how we are to live in the light of the end. 1 Peter chapter 4, beginning at verse 7, and Peter writes, But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober, and watch unto prayer. And above all things, have fervent charity, the word charity means love, among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. As every man has received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as, as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Lord, we thank you for what we've just read. We thank you for the reminder, as even we've sung this morning, that you are the God from everlasting to everlasting. And Lord, just as you began all things, we know that you will bring all things to a conclusion. And Lord, as we live today in this world, we understand that this this life that we have here, while there are many great things to enjoy in this life, we know that this this is not where our hope is. Our hope is in in a future with you our hope is in heaven and ultimately in your return to this earth and so lord we today ask that as we read this passage and we think about what it tells us lord we surely would be living in the light of the end Lord, we don't know exactly when that's going to be but lord we are to live as you tell us in anticipation of that event and lord as we understand what that means help us truly to live to give you glory in our lives and we thank you in jesus name amen Well, we just read the main sort of introduction to that, the end of all things is at hand. You know, there's been a lot of talk about that, um, not just in in churches, and I know a lot of churches talk about end times and things like that, but also in the world we know that um, there's a lot of doom and gloom and impending disaster, and and a lot of people are saying, look, you know, we're running out of time. Uh, We know that even this week we're living in the threat of, potentially nuclear war and World War III. And, uh, you know, that's something that we've really never had before in our lifetimes. Uh, we see a lot of things changing in the world. 
And one of the things we also hear a lot about is this whole climate agenda. It was interesting, I was reading a couple of weeks ago uh, with Prince Charles and uh, was in London with the Mayor of London and they unveiled this, another one of these climate clocks. You know, they say seven years left uh, and all of this stuff. And I was just reading um, this article that said recently uh, King Charles III launched a new clock that will count down to 2030, a year that the government claims will mark serious consequences for the world's climate. The climate clock was unveiled at the Climate Innovation Forum that was uh, held in London on June 28th. This clock, which will be broadcast to 150 public screens around the UK, is inspired by the IPCC, you might have heard of them, and the Millennial Change Corporation, whoever they are, that tell us that, that in order to, uh, we have to limit global warming to uh, 1.5 degrees and take action in the next six years. Well, it says, today with King Charles, uh, His Majesty King Charles, we launched the climate clock, a visual reminder of the urgency of the climate crisis, said Nick Henry, CEO of Climate Action. The climate emergency uh, poses a threat not only to the future of our city, but the future of our world, and that's why it remains a key priority. The climate clock tells us what to do and by when. You might wonder, why on earth did I start talking about climate change? <laughs> I'm not talking about climate change. I'm not here to talk about that. Whatever you, uh, your views are on that, um, the reality is, is that um, we know there have been a long time people saying, you know, the world's going to end and we have to do things. And obviously what they want us to do is follow their seven-year plan, all the things that go with that, whatever you think of that. But we don't follow a climate clock. That's really what I wanted to, to uh, introduce to remind us that. We don't really follow these uh, plans and agendas of man. Rather, we have a clock that's based on God's word and what God tells us. And God actually tells us, yes, the, the, the end is at hand. The things, all things are coming to conclusion. But it's not man's doing. It's God's doing. God who created this world will bring all things to completion as well. And he has a plan, a purpose in doing that. And that... Is, is in his time, but also he gives us plenty of instruction as that as well. And so we don't need to follow a seven-year plan, a 30-day plan, a seven-month plan. What we find here is that God actually gives us uh, his plan, and his plan is live every day. Live every day as if it were our last and live in anticipation of the Lord's return. And that, for us, brings us hope. It's not something, you know, we, the, the climate change people and all of that really want to scare us. They want us to motivate us. They say that there's a crisis happening. Now, we know there's judgment coming to this world, and as we'll see a bit this morning, there's plenty of things that are going to happen that God says is going to happen, and we believe that. We believe what the Bible says about that. Um, but for you and I, if we are in Jesus Christ, the, the coming of the Lord, as we've sung, you know, May it be soon. We want it to be soon because we look forward to it. We will escape the sin of this world. We'll escape the trials of this world and we will be with Jesus Christ. And this is a wonderful um, reminder for those who are going through suffering and particularly Peter's writing to these believers back in the first century that are going through much suffering. They're going through persecution and he's one of the things he wants to remind them about the suffering that they're going through for the sake of the Lord is that the end of all things is at hand. And therefore, he's actually going to give some, some uh, counsel to them as to how they're to respond to that. Just to break this passage down very quickly this morning, in those verses we've read, we'll notice three things. There's a, a reality to consider. That's what we're going to start off with. The end of all things is at hand. We understand what that really means. And, and then secondly, what, what should we do about that? How should we respond? What are we to, how are we to live? Well, we've, God gives us some very clear things here. It's interesting. I, I'm very thankful that we don't have to wonder about it. You know, oh, well, there's not much time left. What do I do? Let me try and figure it all out. No, God actually says, here's how you're to live. And the wonderful thing that we see there is how we're told to live in the light of the end is how we're to live every day as Christians. That's the wonderful thing. And then finally, we'll notice that there's a reason for all this. What's going to motivate us to, to live for the Lord in these, in these last days? And we'll look at that. So let's take a look at, firstly, this reality to consider. And notice in the beginning of this passage, he says, but the end of all things is at hand. What does he mean by that? 
What does the end of all things mean? Now, some have actually said, you, we know it's Peter that's writing this, and Peter, within a few years of this, is going to, he's going to be crucified. He's going to be uh, by Nero, under Nero. He's actually going to be executed. And so that's going to mean the end of his life here on earth. Is he talking about that? Well, I don't believe he is because, he, firstly, he's not aware of that at this point of time. But secondly, he's talking to believers. That wouldn't really bring any comfort to them and encouragement to say, hey, by the way, I'm going to be gone soon. Nor is he saying as this time frame, and we believe this is written in the early 60s uh, AD, uh, and we know that in 70 AD, the Jewish temple in Jerusalem was destroyed. And some say, well, he's really talking about the Jewish system of, you know, the religious system, the sacrificial system, the temple, that's all going to be destroyed. And he's not talking about that either. There's a book that really in the Bible that does warn uh, Jewish Christians about that, and that's the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews is written to Jewish believers who are kind of like going through struggles and saying, well, rather than being a Christian, maybe I'll just go back to that old Judaism. And the, the, the message of the book of Hebrews is... You can't go back. Jesus is greater. Jesus is superior. Jesus is the fulfillment of all that. And in fact, that was written shortly before all of that was destroyed. No, no P Peter's not talking about that. He's not talking about the end of the temple and the, the Jewish religious system. He's not talking about the end of his life. He's not even talking necessarily about the end of their lives in suffering. No, the, the word here, the end of all things, the term end doesn't mean to stop. It means to complete. It's the word telos. It means a completion of everything. God began everything in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. God is going to bring everything to completion. And really what this is telling us is that uh, Peter's clearly returning, uh, referring to the return of Jesus Christ in what is referred to as the last days or the end times. When he says the end of all things is at hand, what he's saying is God is bringing all of human history together. He's culminating human history. And as we have studied a couple of years ago, or, uh, we finished last year the book of Revelation, spent a couple of years in that wonderful book, reminding us about the culmination of human history and how everything is brought together. And as we pray right now, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus Christ will return. He will establish his kingdom and that will go into eternity and a new heaven and new earth. And Peter, I believe, is speaking about this because what we find is that this has been a, something he's already spoken about in this letter. If we go back to chapter 1, and we'll notice a few verses where he mentions this. He starts in, the, in chapter 1, verse 5, talking about that we are kept by the power of God through faith to salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In other words, the conclusion is coming to, and we're ready for this last time. A little further on in chapter uh, verse 7, he says that the trial of your faith being more precious of gold that perisheth, though it be tried by fire, might be found to the praise and honour and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. He's talking about the return of Jesus Christ to this, this earth. And so these are the things that bring uh, these hope and comfort to these believers. And then we are told even in verse 13 that we're to gird up the loins of our mind, to be mentally prepared, to be sober. And this, this, we'll see this today, similar um, instructions but to hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The good news is Jesus came to this world. He died for our sins. He rose again. He ascended into heaven, but he's coming back. And he's going to come back and he's going to set all things right. He's going to deal with sin. He's going to judge sin. And he's, he, and he's going to bring in an everlasting kingdom that begins on this earth and then will uh, go into a new heaven and a new earth. That's, that's the message of the Bible. Well, when will this happen? Notice he says the end of all things is at hand. And that word at hand actually means it's going to be, it's soon, it's, it's, in, it's uh, inevitable, it's going to be uh, near. In fact, the, the word actually means that it's just kind of just on the, on the verge, just on the corner, just um, we're expecting it at any time. And that's what uh, we read in the scriptures here um, that we notice that even in these verses, we've been told that, you know, this is something that we're to anticipate. 
Now, the last times, we're told, are uh, uh, something that we are in today. Now, a lot of people say, are we in the end times? Well, we are. Um, we're in the end times because um, the, the end times began with Jesus, return, Jesus coming to this earth. And we'll look at Hebrews chapter 1 in a moment regarding that. But this is really teaching what uh, a doctrine that the Bible talks about, which is imminency. Imminent means something's likely to occur at any time. And what God is actually telling us is that the, the return of Jesus Christ is something that we look forward to at any time. Now, 2,000 years ago, when these writers of the New Testament wrote it, they were anticipating it as well. And if you take some time to read through the New Testament, you'll find that nearly every book in the New Testament talks about the return of Jesus Christ. And every New Testament writer is living in anticipation of that. And so we're not going to look at all the verses, but I want you to understand that this, this last days, as I just mentioned, began with the coming of Jesus Christ in his first coming. In Hebrews chapter 1, the writer of Hebrews says, God, who at sundry times, or various times in diverse manners, spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days, in the last days, that has spoken to us by his Son. In other words, in the Old Testament, God revealed his will through the prophets, but then he sent his Son into the world, God the Son, Jesus Christ, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he made all the worlds. So the last day is referred to begin with Jesus Christ coming to this earth. And then we come to Romans chapter 13. So I just want to show you the different writers of the New Testament. We could look at lots of verses relating to this. But I want you to understand that very much in the, in the mindset, um, once Jesus had, had gone away, in fact, we notice in Acts chapter 1, his disciples said, will you come and restore the kingdom at this time? And he actually said, you're not to know the days and the, the time but he says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you to go into the world and to, to be witnesses of me. Well, in Romans chapter 13, Paul says this, knowing that the time, that the time, it is high time to awake out of our sleep, for now is our salvation, meaning the end of our salvation, our, our fulfillment of all of that is nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. We looked at this verse last week. Let us cast off the works of darkness, put on the armour of light, fit it in with arming our minds for the will of God. John, so that, that's Paul. What about John? John says, little children, it's the last time. And you've heard that Antichrist shall come. Even now there are many Antichrists whereby we know it is the last time. Now, that was the case back in John's day. Today, even more so, we know, and, and again, I'm not going to go into a, a teaching from Revelation. We've done all that, but we know that the Bible clearly tells us that there will be the rise of one, the Antichrist, one who is not only against Christ, in place of Christ. And even right now, there are, yes, false teachers, but there are those who are, would want to assume the position of Jesus Christ. And we see that even more of those rising in the world today. It's one of the reasons... I think we understand it's the last time. James, another writer. Be also patient, establish your heart, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not against one another, brethren, yes, ye be condemned. Behold, the judge, speaking of Jesus Christ, standing be is standeth before the door. It's as if he's right out there, he's ready to come in. And so I just wanted to show you some of those. We could spend a lot of time going through the various scriptures, but one of the things that we notice is that doctrine of imminency of the fact to, to be in expectation of it, that it could happen, and it's, that we're not only in the last times, but the return of Jesus Christ could come at any time. That is something that we uh, is, is understand is, is being taught right throughout the, the New Testament and has been something that believers have lived in anticipation of. Now, a little bit I just want to cover because uh, we've, we've dealt with this, I know, before. But for those who are, really don't understand this, when Jesus talks about his coming, there's two facets or aspects of it. Jesus told his disciples and, in essence, is telling us two things about his return. Firstly, he says, no one knows the exact time of his return. No, no man knoweth the day and the hour. And he also says that his return will be unexpected and swift. And as I said here, there's two distinct events associated with the return of Jesus Christ. There is the first, which is referred to as the rapture. It is the removal of all true believers, those who have trusted in Jesus Christ from this earth. And Jesus actually says, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place to you, I will come again, receive you to myself, 
that where I am ye may be also. We'll have a look at a couple of verses about that in a moment. That's the rapture of the church. And I believe as we teach here in this church, and I believe when you examine the scriptures, uh, that the, the Bible teaches that that will happen before what we call a, a Daniel's 70th week, a, a seven year period of tribulation. Now that doctrine is under attack, I know, by a lot of people today. A lot of Christians don't like to, to um, uh, are against that, but the reality is the Bible tells us that we are not appointed to wrath. So you and I, as believers, look forward to, what we're looking forward to is not the second coming of Jesus Christ to the earth, because there's gonna be a lot of tribulation before that. No, God's gonna remove us from the earth before that time and that's what we're told the second aspect of christ's return is this what we call the return or the second coming of christ is when jesus christ actually comes and sets foot on this earth so the first as we'll see in a moment we go to meet him in the air we go to be with him remember he says i prepare a place for you where is he gone he's gone to heaven he's preparing a place for us and he says that where i am in heaven you may be also so that means the church is being caught up, is being raptured, is being taken to be with, with the Lord in heaven. Jesus Christ, after seven years of, of judgment, of tribulation, uh, and of really in, in which for the purpose of bringing Israel to a saving knowledge of Christ and, and many others as well, um, will return and he will judge sin. And that's what we understand the second coming of Christ, Revelation chapter 19 and uh, talks about that. We've looked at that already in Revelation and Revelation chapter 20. And I'm not spending a lot of time on this because these are things that we've studied and I really want us to look at how this applies to us. But just a few verses that remind us of this wonderful promise, the rapture. We call it the blessed hope. It's something that we, we know that we look forward to. As, as I mentioned there in John 14, uh, before Jesus went away, before he went to the cross, this is what he said to his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions, many dwelling places. If, I, if it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. That's what he's doing right now. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. Well, how's that going to happen? And why, and this is something, as we said, is, is imminent. It's something that the Old Testament talked about the second coming of Christ. The New Testament talks about it too. There's many prophecies about the return of Christ. But the rapture, we're told, is something that was not revealed in the Old Testament. It is what was referred to as a mystery. And, and Paul says this to the Corinthians, behold, I show you a mystery. In other words, something, something new something that has not been taught in the Old Testament, it's just been hidden in the Old Testament, doesn't mean it, it, it wasn't uh, some, in part of God's plan. Behold, I show you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, in other words, we shall not all die, but we shall all be changed. And he tells us how it's going to happen in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. You know, there's going to come a day, and we don't know when it is, but we live at this any time anticipation where you and I, if you're a believer, are going to hear this trumpet. I don't know if the world's going to hear it, but we're going to hear it. And it's going to be, we're going to be called up into heaven and in the blink of an eye, we're going to be gone. Now, you know, there's been movies about that and people have mocked it and things like that. But it's clearly what the Bible teaches. We shall be changed. In fact, in, uh, it tells us that this corruptible must put on incorruptible. This mortal must put on immortality. You and I will will be given a new glorified body, will be in the presence of Christ. But 1 Thessalonians tells us more about this, how it will happen. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we which are alive and remain. Notice that Paul believed this was going to happen in his time. Paul believed it 2,000 years ago. And in, so what it really means is this... This first phase of Christ's return, the rapture of the church, there is no signs that need to take place. There's plenty of signs we're told about the return of Christ. And as we see some of those signs right now coming into place, we, know, we feel like the rapture must be real close. And, and I believe it is. But we don't, we're not looking for signs. We're looking for the Saviour. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds. People say, where's the rapture? They're caught up. Harpuzo is the Greek word. It's, we are taken up to be with the Lord. 
to meet the Lord in the air. Now, this is meeting Jesus in the air. When he's not yet come to the earth, we will come back with him uh, when he returns. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then it actually says, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. The wonderful comfort for you and I, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, if you've trusted Christ alone as Saviour, is that we are going to be kept from that hour of wrath. We're going to be kept from that tribulation. And it's a wonderful comfort to know that we will soon be with the Lord. The end of all things is at hand. We shouldn't be scared about that. We shouldn't be worried about that. In fact, we should be comforted by that. Now, we cannot do anything to uh, prolong our, our, at the time of, uh, before his return. We cannot make, do anything particularly to make him come back. God has set the hour and the day. We're to be faithful in following him. But we are to realise that that could be at any time. It, in back and right throughout uh, church history, right from the time of those early believers and, and Peter and Paul and James, John, those writers, they all expected that, that Christ could come at any time. Some have said, well, look, it's been 2,000 years and he hasn't come yet. Peter is actually going to say in his second letter, yeah, well, that's what would happen at the last days. There would be mockers, scoffers saying, where's the promise of his coming? Yet another reminder that, that um, God's word is true. What should you do if you, uh, with as knowing the end of things, all things at hand? Well, if you are not a believer in Jesus Christ, I would urge you, I would urge you today to place your trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. The Bible says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given by men whereby we must be saved. The Bible says, if you call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. God sent his son into this world to live a perfect life, die for our sins. And he gave, as we've been looking at in 1 Peter, gave his life for us, the just for the unjust, that he would bring us to God. And maybe as a lot of, maybe you've been uh, in churches before, maybe you've uh, grown up in churches, you've been baptised, you've done all these different things, but none of that will save you. Only Christ will save you. And you need to just call out to him, allow him to save you. It's by grace alone. It's not by any work that we can do. By grace alone, faith alone, in Jesus Christ alone. That's what each of us need to do. If you've not already done that, then... If you want to escape the coming tribulation, escape the coming judgment, you want to know for certain you'll be in heaven when you die, then trust in Jesus Christ. Place your faith and trust in him alone for salvation. For those of us who are believers, we've just read that these words should bring us comfort. They should bring us hope. And in fact, that's what we're to be reminded. We shouldn't be panicking about this. We shouldn't be scared about this. Uh, maybe there's things that you feel you've not yet done in your life and you kind of think to yourself, well, maybe a little bit longer. Well, you know what? Heaven will be greater than anything you've done on this earth, will be greater than anything that, is, um, that you've experienced on this earth. And so we should look forward to that. Now, certainly we want those who do not, our loved ones, friends and family who do not know Christ to come to him. They need to make that choice. But for you and I, we can be comforted. And that's really the encouragement that Peter's giving in all of this. The, the encouragement he's giving here to believers going through suffering is the end of all things is at hand. You'll be home soon. You'll be home with the Lord soon. And you can look forward to that. Well, as we said, what should we do with, in light of that? Because we're still living here and now and we're living each day, I guess, in, in, in anticipation of that. Well, Peter in this main part, and this is where we spend a little bit of time looking at these responses, and he really gives us three responses as to how we are to live in the light of the Lord's return. Yes, we're to live with expectancy, we're to live with anticipation, but how do we live out our daily lives? How do we uh, then live day to day in this world knowing that the time is at hand, that the end of all things is at hand? Well, Firstly, we're going to see, and I guess it shouldn't come as a surprise, that it begins with a Godward focus in all of this. How do I live in light of the end? It begins with my relationship to God directly. And notice he says here, firstly, uh, the end of all things is at hand. Be therefore sober and watch unto prayer. To be sober, to watch, to prayer. The word sober means to be of sound mind. It means to exercise control. It's the idea of curbing our passions. You know, what happens is that often we live according to our own desires, our own lusts. Now, remember, we've already been told by Peter that um, we are to live according to the will of God, not living according to our own ways, our own means, um, but we're to trust the Lord. And, and here, 
he's using this idea of us being sober to be alert, as it were. Um, one writer has said here that it's, it, the, the word to be sober is to, have, to be, have a clear mind. In fact, you might remember in Mark chapter 15, there was this demonically possessed guy and he was, we're told he was sort of racing around, cutting himself, he was doing all these things. And when Jesus cast out the demons from him, we're told that he was clothed and in his right mind. It's the same word here. And so the idea is we're to be right-minded, we're to be sane as it were. We're living in, I guess you'd say, that our world is going insane. You often look at that, everything that's happening in the world today and, and you know, the way that values and everything are being changed around. And what God says is, knowing that the end is at hand, we're to think and have, be in our right minds. In other words, we're to think according to the truth. We're to see things how God sees them. We're to have sanity when it comes to our view of things. And really what it was saying is we're, we're asking God to give us the ability to see things as they really are, to see ourselves as we really are, and to see God as he really is and to even see the world and the lost world as it is as well. You know, there's so many things that would kind of dull our senses, that would kind of deceive us and distract us, and we're living in an age of deception. And therefore, we're told to be sober. This word watch as well is very much linked to sober. In fact, it's translated in, in First Peter earlier as the word sober. And it means, again, to be free from intoxication, not to be drunk. We're not talking about physically drunk, although that's <laughs> he's saying don't do that. But what he's saying is don't be, don't be mentally, don't be spiritually drunk. Don't be drunk on the spirit of this age. The spirit of this age is live for the moment, live for pleasure, live for yourself. You know, whatever, if it feels good, do it. And basically what we realise is this world in which we live in is constantly dulling our senses to the things of God. And what he's telling us is we need to be see things accurately, rightly, objectively. We're to be sober, we're to be awake, we're to be alert. And we're to do this, we're told, for the purpose of prayer. The purpose of prayer really reminds us of that all of this is so that we can communicate with God in the way that he would have us to do so. You know, God speaks to us through his Holy Spirit and through his word, and we communicate with him as we we speak to him and we speak to him. You can do that audibly or inaudibly, but you go before God, you bring your cares, your, uh, your, bring your concerns to him, but not just your cares and concerns. You just spend time with him. And you, as you spend time with him, we want to do that not in, in a way that is just sort of distracted or deceived. We do this in a way which, in fact, would bring us into fellowship and communion with the Lord. And so we are to be... Firstly, we notice here that we're to have our relationship, I guess, focused on God. You know, we're to be right-minded, we're to be sober, we're to be watchful in prayer. This is how we're to live in the light of the end. The second thing you'll notice here is that it says that we're to be fervent in love. And in verses 8 and 9, it says that, uh, And above all things, have fervent charity, <clears throat> and that word charity means love, amongst yourself for Charity shall cover the multitude of sins. We're to have firstly our focus on the Lord, and this really is you know, how we see it, to, to focus on the Lord, to love God, to have a, our, our walk with him. And then as we love the Lord, it causes us also to look at one another and to have love one for another. Now, this might seem a little bit surprising that he's saying really that we're to love one another, and really he's talking about within the church. Now, Thinking the days that we live in and thinking that there's not much time, maybe your first focus is, well, you know, we need to get out there and, and reach the lost. And certainly we do. We need to tell people about Jesus. But really what he's saying here is, above all things, there's a priority for us. And our priority is that we love one another. By this all, shall all men know that you are my disciples, Jesus said, uh, by your love one for another. And we've already looked at this in in uh, this book so far about the love that we're to have. In fact, back in 1 Peter 1.22, seeing ye have purified your souls through obeying the truth through the Spirit to unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. And so this is really echoing what we're just seeing here as well, that you're to have fervent love one for another. The end of all things is at hand, that uh, God says, therefore love one another. And notice the priority of it, it says above all things. 
this should be the priority of, of our love, as our love should begin into one another as brothers and sisters in Christ in the church. To, to have fervent charity among ourselves and really there's an idea here of commitment that we're to continue in that love one for another. Even at times when we're tempted not to, we are to really commit to the Lord and to commit to one another, we're to persevere in that. And he says we're to do that fervently, genuinely, strenuously. The word here really means to kind of go, go out and beyond. And so really what this is reminding us within the church is that we are to show love one to another. Now, as we see in this photo, you people giving each other a hug, but it doesn't mean just giving each other a hug. It means to really to look out for one another. To love actually says is, it just, is not necessarily about our feelings as much as it is about our will, that we choose to, to be concerned with one another and one another's well-being, and we encourage one another in that as well. This is the genuineness of it. And notice it tells us, says that, here that for love or charity shall cover the multitudes of sins you know the fruit of that sort of love is forgiveness for, forgiving one another and forbearing one another we're told these are some of the things that we're told in the scriptures that we if we live in the light of the lord's return we're going to be as we and as we live in with one another and we uh, together in the church there's, look there's going to be times when we do uh, brush up against each other we offend one another but what God says is that love will cover the multitude of sins and notice he doesn't say a few he says the multitude in other words <laughs> there's probably a multitude of sins that go on when you know we're in church and I've heard people say before well I don't want to go to church because you know uh, you know you, sometimes you get offenses and differences and that and I go yeah what a wonderful place to learn love what a wonderful place to learn forgiveness none of us are perfect Christ is perfect but our love is made perfect when we trust in him and when we gather together as, as God's people. And that's why we need to remember that we, we do that. You know, it's, it's a multitude of sins, not just a few sins. And notice uh, also he goes on in verse 9 to tell us as well, not just this having fervent charity or fervent love, he says using hospitality one to another without grudging. Now that hospitality really means uh, it's a, a love of lover of strangers and so it's saying that you know even in a small church like this if there's people you don't know you reach out to them you get to know them you love them as well and and really the the idea and back in the early uh church you know for those who were traveling around particularly those who are missionaries and people who were visiting uh, the way in which they were able to be to, to continue to do that was that people would show hospitality. They would open up their homes to them. They would give them a meal. And very much in the Middle East, that is a, even today, very much a thought of having hospitality. And, and God's saying, that's what we are to do. Notice he says also to do it without grudging. I, I find this interesting. God knows our hearts, doesn't he? You know, we, we do want to serve the Lord. We want to love the Lord. We want to love one another. But sometimes when we do that, we kind of go, oh, I want to have to do that. And we grudge about it. And God says, don't do that. And I, I like the fact that he knows our frailty. That's why he mentions it there. He mentions that we're to love one another without grudging. Don't do it, oh, because I have to. Do it because you want to. And do it out of uh, the fact that Christ has shown love for you. And because of the love that God's shown for you, you are to love one another. Well, finally, we notice that the third response here is that we are to be faithful in service. You know, when, what do we do here in living in the light of the end, living in the light of the end of all things? Well, we're told we're to be watchful in prayer, we're to be fervent in love, and then also we're to be faithful in service. Notice here in verses 10 and 11, as every man has received the gift, even so minister or serve the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Really what he's telling us here is that every one of you, every one of us as a believer, when we trusted in Christ, God has placed in us and given us a, a gift, a gift that has been given by the Holy Spirit for us to use to serve the body of Christ, to glorify God, to help, to serve one another, to serve the church. And what we notice here, it says, as the manifold grace of God reminds us of the fact that there's different gifts that have been given to different people. And I would say that no two, person, no two people have exactly the same mix of gifts. This manifold grace of God is the idea of it's multifaceted. And so what we realize is that when God saved you, he saved you, yes, to bring you to heaven, but he also saved you to, to serve. He saved you to, 
to uh, give you a purpose in, in this life in terms of how you are to serve him. And you, to do that, we, we find within the, the local church, when you read the letters that are written, um, you know, you can do it outside the local church, but much of it, we're told, is given in the, in the context of uh, believers one to another within the local church. And notice he says in verse 11, he gives us a couple of examples. If any man speak... If your gift is in speaking, whether that's preaching like I'm preaching or whether it's encouraging one another or it's just teaching one another, sharing with someone else, he says, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. In other words, don't just share your own wisdom. Don't share your own thoughts on things. If I got up here today and you, you know, I'm, I'm preaching through the word of God, but if I just told you, here's my thoughts on things, it's not really very helpful, is it? You need the God's wisdom. You need the word of God. And that's why in this church, I know sometimes... Our, our messages are long and they're thorough, but I'm trying to, what I, I want to do is to teach the word of God because really that's what you need. That's what we all need. He says, if any man teach, let him speak, let him speak of the oracles of God. But if any man minister, if he serves, it says, let him do with the ability that God giveth. In other words, whatever you do, whether your gift is involving speaking to one another uh, or your gift is involving serving to one another, do it by God's ability, do it by God's grace, do it in God's wisdom, essentially, is what he's telling us. Um, you know, God will give us the ability to serve him, and he'll give us, as he, as he gives us, he'll give us the, the, the means by which we can do that. And so we're being told here that the way that we bless one another, the way that we live, the way that we be faithful in service is to do that in the power that God gives us. You know, too often we try to do things in our own strength. We try to do things in our own wisdom. But God says, look, I'll give you guidance. I'll help you if you, I'll help you use your gift for the glory of God. Some people say, well, what's my gift? Uh, you know, there's all sorts of, today people have all these little surveys and things you can do to find out your gift. It's quite simple. Just do something for the Lord. Just serve the Lord and God will direct you. And you know, I've found after, after years and after, I've found after years of my own uh, being in churches and, and, and following Christ, I never thought I'd be doing this. I never thought I'd be teaching. That wasn't how I started my Christian life. But over time, God, God uh, made it clear that this would be something I do. And God, whether it's, whether it's helping uh, just physical things around the church, whether it's helping one another, whether it's encouraging one another, whether it's financial giving, whatever it is, uh, however God would have you to serve him, just start off serving him. He'll direct you and others will see yeah, you know, that's, that's really we, you know, that's where God's gift is in, in gifting you for that. Uh, there was a, a reality to consider. There's some requirements there to obey. And then finally, why do we do all this? Why would you live out this fervent, this watchful in prayer, fervent in love, faithful in service? Why would you do all that? Well, it finishes up really by telling us this in verse 11, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ. You know, whatsoever you do, whether you eat or drink, or whatsoever you do, do all for the glory of God. God wants us to realize that, you know, we live, we live in the light of the end. We live in this such a way, not for ourselves, but for the glory of God, not for our own glory but for his you know maybe you're hesitant about about some of these things about you know reaching out to to really show love towards one another about serving uh the lord why do i do this well it's for god's glory god is to be glorified in every area of our life and notice it it says god in all things may be glorified in everything that we do and it's been it is through jesus christ we're told you know, God has the idea that we understand here is that the glory it belongs to God, it belongs to Jesus Christ. We understand that Jesus came into this world. He saved us. He saved us from our sin. He brought us to be with God. And the way that we serve God is through Jesus Christ, which because of Christ. You know, we cannot come into the presence of God. We could not um, come to worship God if it, apart from what Jesus Christ has done for us. And to him, we're told be praise and dominion forever and ever. You know, that's what's going to happen at the end when he comes back. Right now, he is to be given praise and he does have dominion, but that dominion will come and he'll set it up on the earth. We you know that when he returns, he will establish his kingdom on earth a thousand years and then goes into a new heavens and a new earth There'll be a, uh, that we look forward to with that. 
So that's the plan. That's the, that's the motivation that God would be glorified. Really what he's saying is that, you know, we should be saying, well, God, be glorified in my life. Um, we sing that hymn, don't we? Uh, be glorified in our life. And, and that it would be in our prayer life, in our love for one another, in our service to the church. And, and as we live right now, not knowing that hour, but really as, as in anticipation of that. And I haven't really gone in today about, you know, we speak, we've spoken before about Bible prophecy and the things related to that, but I really do believe these times are drawing nearer that we, uh, to, to, to what we know will happen at the Lord's return. But we don't look for those signs, as I said, we look to the Saviour and we've told this. The end of all things is at hand. Live in light of the end. And as it says here, that to Jesus Christ, to God, to Jesus Christ, who praise and dominion be forever and ever. And we say to that, Amen. May it be so. May it be so that Christ would have dominion over all the earth. Come, Lord Jesus, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it will is in heaven and that's what we desire well let's pray as we cover quite a bit in that but just uh, to be mindful of these things this morning father in heaven thank you for our time together in your word thank you for this um, reminder lord of the day we live in lord truly the thing the end of all things is at hand you are coming soon and lord we know that uh, we live right now in anticipation of that day we're looking for that blessed hope that glorious appearing of our great God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Lord, we, we live uh, now uh, not only in anticipation of that, we want to live as people that uh, follow you, that obey you. And Lord, I pray if there's anyone here today, Lord, that maybe this is, uh, this is new to them or even that they, they've not trusted in Christ for salvation, help them to know that apart from salvation in you, they are waiting judgment. A judgment that you are not you have said you're not willing that any should perish but all should come to repentance to a change of mind that brings a change of heart and that change of mind is about who you are we know that you are the savior you are the one that gives eternal life and god we're told is loved us so much he bring he god loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth him should not perish but have everlasting life. I pray today if there's anybody that doesn't understand that, Lord, that today they would realise that and they would realise that not by any, anything that they can do that they can enter into salvation, but purely by receiving the gift of God, the gift of eternal life. For us who do know you, Lord, help us to, to be reminded that, Lord, we have nothing to fear. Lord, we, can, we live knowing that you are have saved us, you're keeping us, and you're keeping us until that day, and that you that began the work in us will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to be obedient to you, to be faithful to you, and to live really as we've been shown today. In Jesus' name, amen. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen.